let's see. Welcome to synchronous session 2468. Wow. It's the end of our course and the last part of the final, the last part of the review for the final exam. Um, I can't believe it's been a month. You guys have really hung in there pretty well because this has been a rough, a rough term. But but just hold on to the thought that you're about to have a break, a much needed break that may or may not feel like it with all the lights and the presents and the kids at home and never mind. There won't have to be schoolwork, yay. Okay, we're going to talk about um, inventory. We'll start with inventory. So the neat thing about inventory, and you'll do a lot of this in managerial accounting. Um, the, the thing about inventory is that we've got <clears throat> our goods available for sale, right? That's what we came in with, plus everything we purchased is everything that we could possibly sell to the customer. So that's our, that's our goods available for sale. So if we take everything that's available to sell, it ends up going one of two places. Sorry, I'm loading someone in. <clears throat> it goes one of two places. It's either going to get sold and end up in cost of goods sold on the income statement, or it's not going to get sold and it's still gonna be an ending inventory. So there's no other place for it to go. Because of that, inventory errors are self-reversing. Because let's say the first year you miscount. And so you understate ending inventory. If you understate ending inventory, then you have to overstate cost of goods sold. And then the next year, when you count it correctly, you'll have the correct amount of ending inventory, but your cost of goods sold is going to be lower than it normally would be because your ending inventory count is high to make up for the previous error. So, even if you didn't do any, go back and correct any inventory error, which if it's material, you still should, it's still going to reverse itself because of that closed system. Does that make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. We're gonna work this, we're gonna do FIFO, no, LIFO, last in, first out. But instead of just doing in the inventory, we are also gonna work cost of goods sold because I wanna show you how to check your work when you're doing the test to make sure that you have it correct. All right, so we're gonna, here we'll calculate in the inventory first using last in, first out. So last in, first out. That means the last units that came in, the cost of the last units that came in is gonna be the first costs that go out. So if we're doing ending inventory for last in, first out, and we wanna know, so ending inventory is what's left. Oh, I forgot to erase top down. So if we start last in, first out, for ending inventory, what's left is gonna be at the top layers. And we're gonna work our way down. So what I have here is here's our beginning inventory and our two purchases for $8, $10 and $12 a unit. And I've added up all of them. So I have 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 units available to sell. And they cost a total of $920. Now, the other thing I know is that I have in ending inventory 43 units. So if I'm gonna do ending inventory, how many of these top 30 am I gonna take? Ready? Yep, all of them. So I've got 30 at $8. And I already know that's 240. Okay, but I need 43. So how many of these 20 am I going to take? 
13. Yep. 13. So I'll take 13 of those. So in ending inventory, so it's 130. That worked out nicely. Seven, two. In ending inventory, I have $370 worth of ending inventory. Now, let's say that I was going to do cost of goods sold instead. First in, for last in, last in, first out. So I'm going to start at the bottom and work my way up. I know that I sold 47 units. So how many of these 40 am I going to take? All. Um, so I have 40 at $12 is 480. And then I need 47. So how many of these 20 am I going to take? Seven. Seven. So I'll take seven at $10 is 70. So my cost of goods sold is 550. Now, if I add my cost of goods sold plus my ending inventory, I get 920. And that's because 920 was my dollar amount of my goods available to sell. Everything that was available to sell has to end up one of two places, either in ending inventory or in cost of goods sold. So you can check yourself by working both ending inventory and cost of goods sold. <clears throat> All right, are we good here? So when you indicate something like this, uh, it, looking at it both ways, are you kind of indicating that this question could potentially go both ways on the final? There's going to be like five or six questions. So you're going to have them both ways anyway. What I'm showing you is I'm trying to show you that you can check yourself by working both ways. But yes, because they're algorithmic, you're going to have different numbers. And like one person might have FIFO here and somebody else has LIFO. Mm -hmm. But there's going to be, there are several inventory questions. So mostly this was to show you the, um, the goods available to sell and that it all ends up either in ending inventory or in cost of goods sold. Because you do have a way to check. I like checking because I don't like to be wrong. Because here's another one, <clears throat> just like it. Okay. Um, this is just like question number 25. This is, oh, this one asked for cost of goods sold. We already did, we did ending inventory and cost of goods sold with the earlier one. So I could show you the two together. Okay. Let's do cost of goods sold using FIFO. So we're going to remind ourselves FIFO is first in, first out. So if I'm going to do cost of goods sold, first in, first out. So do I start at the top and go down or the bottom and go up? What leaves first? Top down. So we're going to go top down for cost of goods sold. We know that we sold 47 units. So how many of these top 30 am I going to take? All of it. All of it. All of it. Did someone say 11? No. Before that. Okay, good. I'm hearing things. 240. Okay, I need seven more, 17 more. So I'm going to do those here. This looks like what we just did, except for it's because we're doing cost of goods sold first at $10 is 170. So 410. If we were going to do ending inventory, first in first out. 
where are our units remaining? At the top or at the bottom? Ending inventory sits where? At the bottom, yeah. Ending inventory sits at the bottom. So we're gonna go from the bottom up for ending inventory because, and if I was gonna do it like with a picture when I was on the test, I might think first in, first out. Okay, so I'm gonna start here and I'm gonna go down, right? And that helps me remember. <clears throat> Okay, so ending inventory is that are stuck at our bottom. We have 43 units in ending inventory. So I'm gonna take all 40 of these and three of these. And notice also, now all the units are accounted for, 30, 17 plus three is 20 and 40. So for ending inventory, I have 40 at 12, which is 480. And then I have three at, 10, which is 30, 510. Okay, are we good there? <clears throat> All right, this one's easy for you. This is just calculating the discount. Um, we owe $5,000. So first of all, you're figuring out, okay, all we're doing is calculating the payment. Not, we don't need a journal entry. So we owe $5,000 on an invoice with terms 210 net 30. So that means 2% discount. So if I wanted to know what I was going to pay, I'm going to take the $5,000 that we owe times 98% and I see, okay, I'm gonna pay 4,900. And your discount might be 1% on the test or it might be 3%. The amount you owe might be 4,500. Same concept though. Right. Okay, depreciation. <clears throat> So straight line is simple because it's the same every single period. So that's what we're gonna look at first. So calculate straight line depreciation for, and this is often, for year two. Now with straight line, it doesn't matter because every year is, is, is the same, or at least every 12 month period is the same. Year one won't be the same because we bought it in May. So we need the formula, which is our cost minus the salvage value divided by the life. So the truck cost us $20,000. It has a $5,000 salvage value and it has a five year life. So we have $5,000 $5, a year, right? $4,000 a year. So our depreciation is $4,000 a year. Now, if we were recording year one, it wouldn't be $4,000 because we started in May. But for year two, we have the full year, so it is $4,000. Are we good with straight line? Yeah, before we get to the weird ones. Should that be 3,000? Maybe. Figured, hey, I would just do the math in my head tonight. 20,000 divided by five. No. Why do you think it's 3,000? What am I missing? Probably no, I'm getting 20,000 minus 5,000 divided by five. Just oh, because I forgot to. Yeah. See, at least I knew it was me. Yeah, 15,000 divided by five, 3,000. Thank you. Okay, that's straight line. So, and this is exactly how it is asked. So you're looking at year two. <clears throat> okay, this is the one, this is the one that is, I'm gonna show you how to work it. 
So depreciation is an estimate. It's an estimate in the life of the asset. It's an estimate in the salvage value of the asset. And because those are um, estimates, they can change in the middle of a life. So here's how you approach that. So we want to know what is the depreciation expense in year four, okay? So the first thing we're going to do is figure out um, what is on our books now. So the truck has an original life of five years, a cost of 20,000 and a salvage value of 5,000. It's been depreciated for three years. So we already know 20,000 minus 5,000 divided by five years is 3,000 a year. So if it's been depreciated for three years, the depreciation expense goes away every year, but the accumulated depreciation doesn't. So in year one, we recorded $3,000 of accumulated depreciation. In year two, we recorded $3,000 of depreciation. In year three, we recorded $3,000 of depreciation. So what's on our books right now is we have a cost of 20,000. Less my accumulated depreciation of 9,000. gives me a book value of 11,000. All right, so, and, and we know that salvage will be 3,000 now instead of 5,000. And its life should be seven years. So seven years, and we've already used up three. So we have four years left to depreciate. Okay, so does everything that I just did for where we stand right now at the end of three years make sense? Okay, because now all we're gonna do is we're gonna pretend like we started right now. The most we can depreciate is the $11,000 because 9,000 has already been depreciated. So I'm gonna, so number two is start from there. So we're gonna say, the asset's worth 11,000 because I can't depreciate more than that, minus my salvage value, which is now 3,000, divided by the years that are left, which is four years are left. So 11,000 minus 3,000. 3,000 divided by four, two, two grand a year. So my depreciation expense each year for the rest of its life will be 2000. Mm -hmm. And that's the depreciation expense for year four. And when we're all done, when we go all the way through seven years, we'll have um, $3,000 remaining. And you, so, in, your, in your journal entry, you actually logged that under the description, right? That adjusted yeah, you would, I would make a note there. Yeah, plus yeah. you calculate depreciation. So I'd have it wherever I calculated it to. But yeah, you want a good paper trail so that when you're looking at your schedule a year later and you're like, what? Why did, why did I, right, wait, wait, why did I do that? Yeah, 
you don't want to leave yourself to remember. That should be a good example of that. Yeah, we're not big on descriptions when we're doing the problems in the textbook, but in the real world, descriptions are really important. Yeah, in the journal entries. So. Yeah. Well, and you also would have working papers. So like you'd have a depreciation schedule and you would make a note on that schedule too. So like when you, any journal entry you make, any anything you do actually, you have documentation for it. But with journal entries, your documentation might, might be as simple as written notes or a copy of something. Mm -hmm. um, we did this. <clears throat> okay, declining balance. This is the weird one. This is the only weird method. And the reason it's so weird is because you don't subtract the salvage value out at the beginning. So with all of the other methods, you take the salvage value and you set it aside. So it's still there when you're all, when you're all done because you set it aside. With declining balance, you're not setting it aside. The other weird thing about declining balance is that everything is calculated um, with the rate times the book value and the book value changes every period because remember a book value is your cost minus your salvage value that's not what i meant appreciation yeah i'm like no that that is not what i meant no i can't get So this is gonna change every single time. Okay, the declining balance is what's called an accelerated method because you take more depreciation expense at the beginning and less at the end, which kind of makes sense like if it's a piece of equipment or you know, like let's say you're looking at a car because it becomes less efficient as it becomes older, right? Mm -hmm. So more company purchases a machine at the beginning of the year at a cost of 32,000. So we know that our cost is $32,000. The machine is depreciated using the double declining balance method. Okay, so let's talk about the rate. It's life is five years. When we're calculating the rate, it's double the straight line rate. But let's, let's talk about how to calculate a rate. So this one's five years. That means each year we take one fifth of its value, which means each year we take 20%. If we want to do double declining balance, then it's going to be multiplied times two is 40%. Let's say instead, let's say that the life was seven years. It's still gonna be every year we take one seventh. So one divided by seven, every year we take about 14% times two is gonna be 28%. Times the book value. Okay, so that's that's the first thing. You have to be able to calculate the rate. And on a lot of them, all you have to do is calculate the rate. All right, so on this one though, we want the machine's book value at the end of year two. So it's really important that you read on here, like, what am I trying to find before you answer the question? So we want to do their book value at the end of year two. So I have to figure out the depreciation for year one and for year two, and it's gonna be different. So for year one, I've got my $32,000 book value because I don't have any accumulated depreciation, right? Times my rate 
and my rate is 40%. So my depreciation expense in the first year is $12,800. That also means my accumulated depreciation right now is $12,800. <clears throat> All right, so that's year one. For year two, we have to do our book value. Our book value is our cost minus our accumulated depreciation. times our rate. So now we have 32,000 minus 12,800 times- 19,200. Thank you. What? The 19,200 is the, like the start minus the, the uh, depreciation. Oh. Yep, times 40 is gonna be 11,520. That's your ending book value. Wait, 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 wait. I'm That's off. your ending book value. Your okay. expense is 76 for year yeah. two. Yep, minus one, two, I gotcha. Times 40%. I'm gonna confuse everybody. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Sorry. No, 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 you're good. I gave the wrong number first. That's good. This is 26,880, right? Why would that be? What is that? Forward? No, that has to be less. 32. It's 7680. That's fine. Depreciation have, for yeah, year like, two. Yeah, like it can't be right. Okay, so now I have 7,680. So at the end of year two, my accumulated depreciation is 20,000. 480. And what you're asked for is you're asked for the book value. So now you're going to take your cost of 32,000 less your accumulated depreciation of 20,480. Okay, now you want to give me that number? 11,520. Thank you. So your new book value is 11,520. So declining balance is the one that's challenging. I know, right? So a couple of the questions, all you have to do is, which you'll see, but a couple of them, all you have to do is answer the rate you have to be able to convert the straight line rate. And then there's this one, I'm not sure if there's another one or not, where you have to calculate like something with declining balance. But you do have these notes. Can I erase it? Okay. Okay, so gross pay and net pay, you're already familiar with this because mm -hmm. I can tell by looking at you that you all work <laughs> or you have somebody that works because someone's paying your bills. Um, if you look at your paycheck, you know, it's like if they say, hey, you're making $60,000 a year, you don't just get to go, oh, good. So $60,000 a year divided by 26 pay periods. Great, my check will be $2,300. No. That, that's, your, that's your gross pay. That's not what you're gonna get them because out of that is gonna come your federal, your state tax, insurance, union dues if you have them. Um, in California, if you're in California, you're gonna pay part of unemployment, which is not common in most states, um, which is why if you're looking at the textbook, you won't see that in the example because most states don't make you pay that. So, um, but that's the difference between gross pay and net which you already know. Oh, let's see. Okay, so on the, I know, why did I erase my work? Because the pencil has memory. 
On November 1st, Allen Company signed a 120-day 10% note payable with a face value of $22,500. We want to do interest, accrue interest, at December 31st. So first of all, this started November 1st. So we have November and December. So it's two months, right? So principal times rate times time. So 22,500 times my rate, 10%, times my time, I could say 120 over 360. So 22,500 zero, zero, times 10% times 120 divided by 360. So it's $750 total. That's at, that's at maturity though, right? What? That's at maturity? That's yeah, actually, a, I don't even need that. Okay. I could do... Because we're only doing 60 over 360. Yeah, I right? could do 36. Oh yeah, it's only half, it's just half. Yep. Right. Yeah. For what so we could now. just say divided by out two months out of four mm -hmm. months. Yeah. Is three seventy five. And so we need to do the adjusting entry. So we're going to record interest. Ex so make a note because I'll ask you both ways. So this is a note payable. So this is interest expense. Mm -hmm. Make sure you read carefully that it's not. And then if I have in interest expense of $375, but I'm not paying it now, what's my other account? Interest payable. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yep. So instead of doing that 120, um, could you just do it? Could you just do 60 for November and December mm -hmm. and divide it by 360? Yeah, you could. You could. Yep. Okay. Yep. 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 Yeah. The important thing is to one, realize, which doesn't come into play here so much, but one, realize that this 10% is always for one year. But then also realize, like, if we're talking about days, I looked at it and it's like, okay, every month is 30 days. So 120 is four months, right? But you have to look like, are you using days? Are you using months? Are you using years? You know, what's the, what's going on the bottom tells you what's going to go on the top. <clears throat> this one's straightforward. Some aren't. The test is. How many questions is the final? 50? 49, oddly enough, uh, 48, oddly enough. Okay. D don't ask me why, I don't remember why. <laughs> How much time do we have for that? Um, hours. I'll look in a minute. Remind me to look at that. I just did that one. Oh, okay. Okay, so sales tax is not revenue. I think it's three hours right now. Sales tax is not revenue, right? If you sell something and you collect tax for it, sales tax, you're taking that tax from the customer and you're remitting it to the government, right? So sales tax is not revenue. So if we sold a piece of equipment for $500 cash and we had sales tax of 7%, we received 500 times 7%, So we received $535. So we're going to receive cash of $535, sales tax payable of $35, 
and sales revenue. of $500. Are we good there? Did I say 1.07 or is this supposed to be Yeah, because, yes, because um, if I wanna know how much cash, I can, it's just like the discount, 500 times 1.07 is all of it plus 7%. So then I figure out how much cash I had. If I wanted to know how much my discount was, then I could say 500 times. Um, 0.07. Yeah, 0 0.07 is $35. Okay. <clears throat> it's, if you're trying to figure out like the amount of cash, if you do it this way, if you learn how to do that, you'll make fewer mistakes because a lot of the time you'll only have one calculation instead of, you know, like doing the 0.07 and then subtracting or adding. I mean, here it's obvious because it's $35, but it's not always. So if you learn that, it makes it, you'll, it, you'll be more accurate. I guess it seems a little confusing to me, that question. Um, and maybe it's just the way I'm reading it or whatnot. That, that, Am I supposed to subtract the 7% out of the 500 or add the- No, it's like when you go to the obviously... store. Yeah, if you went to the store and there's this $500 um, video game system you're gonna buy <clears throat> and you have $500 in your pocket, is that gonna be enough for the video game system? No. And I know, I, Ryan, you, you're like my son. You could probably talk them down to $500. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> You're like, well, it should be. It's an awful lot for a gaming system. Yeah, so that's why. It's because the sales tax is in addition to, you know, when you look at it, it's never, it's never. I don't know people get pissed off like that because they tell them, like, you're supposed to add in and go buy something. Oh. And it won't be the same price. So apparently it's important to understand this. And it <clears throat> all the time. Because my daughter works in retail. She actually had this problem at the rink with somebody not understanding okay, sales tax, no. but they were upset because she was charging them less because they didn't calculate a discount, but no, it's Starbucks. No, Wait, we have no lots of used merchandise. Oh, there's no tax on used merchandise and the lady yeah, wanted to pay tax. <clears throat> say, hey, there's no tax on used merchandise. That the person couldn't understand why. And she's like, at Starbucks, apparently they'll look at the drink and it's no, like, no, that oh, they don't. Good. Oh, in retail only, okay. Yeah, so it's important to understand sales tax in the real world. <clears throat> Especially this time of year when money's skewing out of the checking account. Now I will not forget that. <laughs> no, I didn't embarrass you, did I? No, it was, uh, Brian, it was meant as a compliment. My son one time, he wanted, um, he had a, a helmet for like um, hockey but he wanted to ride the new um, golf cart we, the new go-kart we had, that's it, the words. And so he had to have a face shield. So he wanted to, I was busy or whatever, and he wanted to take his own money and ride down to the, um, the store that sold those things that was somehow within riding distance. I guess I was so busy that I let him go anyway. And he came back and he's like, well, I didn't have enough money. And I'm like, but you have the helmet and this wasn't a play it again sports, you know, where like it's negotiable. And he's like, yeah, I just told him I didn't have enough money. And so they just said that they just take what I had and sold it to me. And I'm just like, that would like never happen to me. And so, and you remind me, Ryan, it's, so it's a good thing as someone that could be, a, that would be able to just, well, of course you should give it to me for that price. I don't know how he did it. I still don't know how he did it. Okay, this is another one with interest. So um, here we have a 60-day note, and it was taken out on April 12th. $5,100 note to extend the due date on an overdue account. What is the journal entry? that Indigo Company would make when it records the payment of the note. 
really important. Like, what am I doing? I'm going to record when the note is paid at its maturity date. So at its maturity date, it, they're going to pay us the interest plus the principal. So remember, the note payable is always the actual amount of the note. And then the cash, you're going to add the interest. So 5,100 times 6%, 60 over 360. So the total interest is $51. Don't get confused on this one. There's a homework question where it's like a payment was made to extend the due date on an overdue account. This only matters when you record the initial entry where you issue the loan. It has nothing to do with when there's payment made on the loan. Oh, new stuff. Okay, cool. All right, stop. So this first one's a little weird because this one is actually issued for legal fees. So what you need to know is that we have, let's learn some terminology. You need to know about authorized, issued, outstanding, and treasury stock. So, authorized are where the board of directors says we're going to authorize the sale of shares. So like here they're saying we've authorized a hundred thousand. That has nothing to do with the journal entry. There's no journal entry. It's just the board of directors saying you may sell stock. The par value has no significance whatsoever in anything anymore except for recording the journal entry because the par value is what goes into the common stock account. So it's, it's really weird because par value doesn't mean anything, but it means everything to how you record it. So the company issued 230 shares of stock to its attorneys in payment of a $4,300 charge to drop the articles of incorporation. So the attorney did work for us and instead of writing him a check for 4,300, we're issuing him 230 shares of stock. Now, because we're issuing him or he's accepting 230 shares of stock in exchange for $4,300 worth of legal fees, we can assume that the stock is worth $4,300. So we're going to we're going to do two things. We're going to record the legal um, fees, the expense for our legal fees, and that's for $4,300. Now, how we issue stock. Everything's going to go into um, the par value is going to go into the common stock account. So so for common stock, we're going to take $10 par times 230 shares or $2,300 goes into common stock. Everything else goes into a new account for you. It's really long. We can just call it paid in capital after this. Paid in capital, in this case, in excess par of par. Yeah. And that's for all the rest. So here, there's not a market value. I mean, it's 4,300, I don't have a market value by share. So 4,300 minus 2,300, which I oddly just used a calculator for, gives me $2,000 going into my paid in capital account. Okay, so there's this paid in capital account is interesting because you're gonna have a lot of them. like. <clears throat> paid in capital and excess of par, paid in capital and excess of stated value for common and preferred stock. Um, if you sell, if you have treasury stock, you'll have, and you resell it, you'll use a paid in capital account. You use it a lot. If you were looking at a company's financial statements, typically the amount of money in equity in their common stock account is far less 
than what's in their paid in capital account. Because par value is typically like a dollar or a penny or 0 0.00001 cents, literally. So, but what you can always see, because par value doesn't change, what you can always see from the common stock account is how many shares have been um, issued. So authorized is the number of shares the board of directors says you can sell. Issued means that you've sold them. Outstanding means that they're still being held by somebody out by a shareholder. And treasury stock is stock that the company has repurchased. So outstanding shares are the shares that were issued minus any treasury stock that was repurchased is still what's outstanding. So they stay issued right? Unless the company cancels them. So that's authorized, issued, outstanding, and treasury stock. All right, well, we're going we're to do more um, stock transactions. So here's a journal entry to issue stock. We sold 5,000 shares of stock. We sold them for $10 the par value was $1. So the first thing is, how much cash are we gonna get? That market price, is that per share? Yep, 5,000 times $10 yeah. per share. So we're gonna get, huh? 50,000. Yeah, 50,000 in cash. Now, mm -hmm. we're gonna issue our common stock One dollar par. Yep. So it's going to be five thousand dollars. That's the five thousand shares times the one dollar par. And then the paid in capital. Excess. Par. In excess of par is going to be five thousand dollars. Yep. Times. Nine dollars, forty-five thousand, and preferred stock works exactly the same, except for the par value on preferred stock is used to calculate dividends, but the journal entries to issue it are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I give you credit for 41. I don't and 42. I don't like the you'll there'll be different numbers for you, but I add two questions to the scores. Oh look, I already told you this. Authorized shares, issued shares, outstanding shares, and the treasury stock. So one of the questions is you have to calculate the outstanding shares given authorized issued and treasury shares. So that's why I said the outstanding shares are everything that was issued minus anything that was bought back by the company is so that everything else is still outstanding. Okay, so all common size, so, we, so we're trying to figure, all common size means is to convert it to a percentage. So here, like the corporation reported cash of 15,500 and total assets of 179,000 800 on its balance sheet. If we want to know the percent of cash, we're going to take cash divided by the total assets to get the percent. What that tells me is that 8.62% of all of my assets are cash. Mm -hmm. The reason this is important is if I had a small business that I said, oh yeah, we're good with cash. I've got like $15,000 in the checking account. <clears throat> And I'm talking to Starbucks and they're like, you only have $15,500 in the checking account. My gosh, how are you ever gonna survive? We have 15 million. And we're like, yeah, but it's still only, you know, 8% of. So this way you can compare 
for instance, um, when the economy crashed and accounts receivable started going up because people weren't paying their bills, they were financing things, um, you could compare the effect on a smaller company and a larger company. Because when you do it, that's why it says common size. When you convert it to a percent, then it's meaningful when you're comparing different sizes of companies. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is one that um, you have a homework question that I said you don't have to do. So what we're doing is we want to figure out the trend percentage for years two and three. And what's funny about this is that we want to know, like, we're going to compare everything to a base year. That, that's what's different about this. So in other words, I'm not saying in year one, we increased like, so in year one, we had sales of 520,000. And then in year two, 570,000. And in year three, 620,000. I'm looking at how is this changing from year one to year two? And then how is it changing from year one to year three? So this first one in year two, I'm saying, okay, in year, in year two, we had 570,000 in revenue divided by year one. Wait, I, well, I wrote that right here. So year two divided by year one times 100 gives me revenue increase 9.6%, or it went up 109.6% between year one and year two. Then here, this is year three, and this is still year one. So between year one and year three, it increased 119.2%. What I don't have here, right, because I'm comparing it all to a base year, what I can't tell you from here is what was the increase from year two to year three. Like, I can't see from this, you know, oh, I went up 10%, 9%, 8%, wait, what's happening? Or, you know, it went up 10%, 11%, oh, that's good. That I can't see. Has a different purpose when you're using a base year. You have to calculate the acid test ratio. If you look at the formula for the acid test ratio, it lists all of the things that you need to add together, like cash and accounts receivable and short-term investments. But what the acid test really does is the acid test ratio is a liquidity ratio. And liquidity is looking at the short term, the next year, right? Um, it, these tell you, can we pay our bills in the next year? The two big ones is the current ratio. And in the current ratio, you take your current assets and you divide it by your current liability. The other one is current assets, less inventory is basically what you're doing. When you do the asset test ratio, what you're basically doing is taking inventory out of the current assets. And the reason that's a valuable formula is because inventory relies on a customer to sell it to in order to pay your bills. Like you can't, you can convert accounts receivable to cash by factoring them. You're gonna take a hit, but you can get the money. You can't convert inventory to cash without selling it. There was a company called Coal Educational Supplies. This it's still astounding to me because it's been many, many years. So Coal Educational Supplies, I grew up in Houston. Coal Educational Supplies supplied all of the schools in the Southwest and had I mean, I knew the name, it was a household name. I mean, in my whole life, it had 
it had served them and, and from long before me. All of the school districts had them wrapped up tight. Um, they happened to be a client of the CPA firm that I worked at. And we went out and we did an audit and all that was fine. We did inventory, counted the office price and everything. And then a few months later, we found out they were going to sell the company. So we went out and we did a due diligence audit, basically of like, where is everything right now? They sold the company. When we came back out to do inventory, like nine, 10, 11 months later, we literally had to put a going concern clause in the audit report. And what that means is we had, we had to say that we didn't think the company would survive another year. When we went into the inventory room to do inventory, you literally had to blow the dust off the piles of spiral notebooks and blue and just, I mean, it was, it was like, it was like a ghost town in the inventory room. And so it showed me two things. One was how important inventory is. Right? I get the asset test ratio because they might have had a good asset sitting on their books and in inventory, but they clearly weren't selling it. But the other thing that it showed me was, I, I, don't, I, I don't understand how somebody could have all of those contracts and all of that history where you know what they buy and you know what they want and still blow it. But you can run a solid company with a huge customer base and, and a completely untarnished reputation you can run it into the ground in a year by mismanaging inventory. And you have to calculate that ratio again. And again, I would know the acid test ratio if I were you. Okay, how do you feel? Good. How's the paper going? And I, I'm gonna, while you tell me how the paper's going, I'm gonna go check how long you have for the test. How's paper's the paper? going, paper's going okay. I was just, yeah, I just wanted to ask you how long again. It's three it's hours. Like three hours, it is. Isn't it three hours that we have for the quiz as well? Uh, the quizzes? I like, think the quizzes are a couple, are like an hour and a half or two hours. Are they three hours also? Yeah, three hours across the board. I've never had anybody say that they didn't have enough time for the test. Yeah, three and hours is a lot for the quizzes. For this, uh, I hope okay. it's a lot. You know what? Hold on one second. Just one, let me pull up national. I don't know if I could do accounting for yeah, more good. than three hours anyway. Oh, that's not the point. I'm, at, I'm actually going to extend the time, but that's, but that's not the point. I don't want you to take, I strongly advise against you taking the entire final exam without standing up and, and walking around. Because it, it's too long to, it's, it's too much to think about without standing up and moving, moving around. In fact, that's why you have so much time. I try to give you, and I haven't looked at the time on this one and someone else has been in my course, so I should double check it. But I try to give you plenty of time so that if you have test anxiety or if you, um, mostly if you have test anxiety, because I have never, I, I can see how long you take on the test. I don't literally, I don't normally go and look um, I have in the past, like when the course is new, just to see how it's going. Why am I going here from here? But, um, but normally I don't, but I have never seen anybody run out of time. Okay, I'm almost there. In our <clears throat> What? Has anyone else had problems in the course today? Mm -hmm. hmm. 
try going back in again then. That's weird. Okay, so here's what I'm getting. <clears throat> I'm not sure why. My announcements are good, but every, oh, you know. I'm seeing that uh, Blackboard just sent out a message saying that students and faculty were having trouble. Well, that explains it. <laughs> that would, um, that, that would explain it. Okay, so this is a good time to mention, so I'll go in, I'll, I'll extend the time tomorrow when I sit down, but you, I've never had anybody run out of time. Um, so this is a good time to mention this since we just saw this. These things can happen, right? <clears throat> um, the beauty of being able to go to school online is that you can do it from your living room. Um, the beauty of going to school online at National is that we have experience with online, so you're not struggling like all the other people that have teachers that don't know how to do online. Um, the disadvantage is that sometimes technology doesn't work. And so Let's say this was to happen on the weekend. It normally doesn't, but let's say it did, okay? Even if it's nine o'clock at night, your time, when it's finally quiet and you sit down to take the test, which no judgment, I totally get that that's when it's quiet. If I had my kids, that's when I'd be taking it. Obviously, I'm asleep. Something weird happens like this and it's continuing and you can't get in. Just take a deep breath and just know that when you reach me, we'll figure it out. Okay, I don't think that there will be a problem, but this is just a good time to remind you that if there is, or if anything happens, you can breathe and just know it's okay. I know you guys, we've been together all, all month. I'll, I'll make it okay for you, it'll be fine. Okay. Um, all right, any other questions? Questions about the paper? You're good with the paper? Single you, double space. You spade. mentioned uh, there was a question on the homework that you didn't require us to do. do yeah, when I grade, I'll automatically add points. Okay, so just complete the homework and yep. then if we mess that one up, whatever. Yep, don't worry about it. I'll automatically add points. I'll do it this was that, it probably Was that for the homework or was that for the other one? Uh, there's a couple on the practice too. Wait, the practice, yeah, yeah. I know the practice one. Yeah, you want to know the truth? This week, I really only care about your final exam grade. Well, and, and that's true anyway. That's what I was saying about, you know, learn smart also. It's like, if you do well on the test, my, my goal is for you to be able to do the work. So if you're getting it on the test, then you're do as long as you're doing it yourself, you're doing the work somehow that works for you, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what matters to me. Remember you can, re most of your grades are all good, but remember you can replace your lowest um, quiz grade with the final exam grade. Give me a little time to go back and do that. Um, I don't think that anybody here does. I've talked to some of the other people in our class, but if anything is going on and you need an incomplete, let me know shoot me an email, but also send me a text. The emails for me to use as substantiation. But um, like I said, I don't think it applies to anybody that is here right now, but if it does, or if something happens this weekend and all of a sudden it needs to apply to you, let me know. You know, I also know that um, some schools get out Friday. Mine always did. Here they don't, they don't get out till after, oh, well, my husband does. My, my kids haven't, it's weird. I never went to school. I, I, my birthday's the 20th, so I know. I, I never went to school on my birthday. So I know that a lot of you have kids getting out of school, which makes the weekend crazy. Um, we have this a luxury of having a break. I know there's also a pile of pre presents to wrap and, and all of that, but there is flexibility. So if you need it, let me know. Also by... Wednesday or Thursday, there won't be anybody in the university if I turn my grades in. Seriously, if you need flexibility, let me know. I know that life is 
challenging at its best right now and that everybody has something going on, even if you're not talking to me about it. Okay. Also, you should know that I've raised two teenagers that are both challenging in their own ways and a husband who I'm still not done raising. My family is rampant with ADHD, um, which I don't understand at all in spite of the fact that I'm trying to. I've been through virtually anything that could happen going to school, except for some of the stories I've heard from students that were even worse. So there just, there isn't, there isn't a lot. You just have to trust me. There isn't a lot that you could call me that I would be astounded about, or, I mean, I'm just, I'm not. So. No, I'm not going to, oh yeah, no, no, I'm, this is why I like your art teacher, not your sociology teacher. Yeah, my daughter's sociology teacher, she had surgery the first week of class, it was an online class, college, and her professor was like, oh, that's fine, honey, oh, you poor thing, blah, 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 and then we get her grade back on her discussion, and she's like, exemplary discussion, too bad it was at the last minute, 70% out of 100, and, I, and I'm just like, I'm like, you know what, I'm looking at it and I'm like, okay, I know that you can forget but if you're not gonna take good notes, then you shouldn't take off points. If you're gonna take off points, you should at least keep track of why somebody might've turned it in. So you don't say something like, ah, oh, too bad you had surgery and you didn't turn your discussion in. Yeah, meanwhile, her art teacher's like, oh, honey, that's okay. I'm so glad you made it to class. Let's just work through it, you know? And she still has an A in sociology, but it kind of leaves you with a bad feeling. But right now, Everybody just needs to work together or we're not going to get through all of this. So I'm trying to do my part. All right, you're going to call me if you have questions. I'm not going anywhere. Um, I am celebrating my birthday on Sunday, but that's okay. I can still talk accounting while I'm celebrating my birthday. Huh? What, Doug? Yeah, I I've been telling them text me first so that I can stop answering my phone so that people stop calling me about my student loans that have been canceled. Oh, I could give them your phone numbers. Did you know that your student loans could be like completely canceled? It's amazing. <laughs> I have to just answer the phone and like click zero and, and they just go away. All right. <laughs> I will see you. No, I won't. Um, call me if you have questions, text me if you have questions, good luck on the test, let me know if you need flexibility, um, and other than that, keep my phone number, keep in touch. I will talk to you later. All right, bye, you guys. Thanks, Robert. Bye. Thanks for coming.